Hello, and welcome to worship on this 4th of July holiday weekend. My name is Bonnie Taylor, and I'm the pastor of Faith United and West Sunbury Presbyterian Churches. I'm happy to announce that after much prayer, deliberation, and the work of our COVID-19 response task force made up of members from both churches, the sessions have voted to work towards beginning to meet again for corporate worship on Sunday, August 9th. Our highest priority is the health and safety of each person who enters our buildings. So when we do come together, we will do so in a way that complies with the CDC recommendations for faith communities. And we have a strategy to do just that. Watch your mail and our online worship for more details to follow. It will be so good to be together again in worship. Also, on August 9th, we will begin our new worship schedule. Sunday worship at Faith will begin at 9.30 a.m., while West Sunbury worship will begin at 11.30. Please mark your calendars now so that you don't miss out on our time together. And now, hear our call to worship. In deep gratitude, we come to worship God. We recognize God as the source of all goodness. All good gifts come from the Spirit of God. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness are all of God. We come with grateful hearts, not for things, but for who God is. We gather to show our gratitude in song and prayer. Join me now for our prayer for illumination. Let's pray. Holy God, as you once gave your sacred word to your people on tablets of stone, now engrave your truth on the tablets of our hearts so that we may know and follow your way of abundant life. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This being the 4th of July weekend, when we celebrate our national independence, caused me to spend some time thinking about the meaning of freedom. 
For me as a baby boomer, one of the first things that came to mind was Janis Joplin belting out the lyrics from me and Bobby McGee. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Ah, the naivety of the early 1970s. But then I dug a bit deeper and remembered some of the stirring words regarding freedom of the patriotic heroes from our nation's history, such as Patrick Henry's is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And Thomas Jefferson's writing in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. John F. Kennedy shared his vision. I look forward to a great future for America, a future in which our country will match its military strength with our moral restraint, its wealth with our wisdom, its power with our purpose. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt, speaking out of the context of World War II. In the truest sense, freedom cannot be bestowed. It must be achieved. And then there are the words from two of our Christian spiritual leaders, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. And the Negro needs the white man to free him from his fears. The white man needs the Negro to free him from his guilt. And finally, from our chaplain, former chaplain of the Senate and Presbyterian pastor, Peter Marshall. May we think of freedom not as the right to do as we please, but as the opportunity to do what is right. Our scripture text this morning also raises a standard of freedom, a freedom that's bounded by love and governed by the Holy Spirit. So please listen now to the words from Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, and then we'll move down to verses 13 to 25. Hear the word of God. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
There are more than 50 references to freedom in the New Testament, each of them exploring a different dimension of what Paul calls in his letter to the Romans, the glorious liberty of the children of God. Galatians has been dubbed the Magna Carta of Christian freedom. Theologian James Montgomery Boyce states that this is quite correct, for it rightly maintains that only through the grace of God in Jesus Christ is a person enabled to escape the curse of his sin and of the law and to live a new life, not in bondage or license, but in genuine freedom of mind and spirit through the power of God. Paul writes his letter to the Galatians not because they were living and experiencing their glorious liberty as God's children, but because they were divided into camps that were biting and devouring each other. One camp believed that to be free in Christ meant that they could do whatever they pleased. If it feels good, do it. They believed their behavior had no bearing on their relationship with God, and so they found themselves slaves to promiscuousness and unprincipled sexual immorality, corruption, drunkenness, carousing, gluttony, and the use of black magic. My husband is a big fan of Elton John's music. So for his Father's Day celebration, we watched Rocket Man, a movie musical about his life. The music in the movie is fantastic, but to see Elton's narcissistic drive for celebrity and acceptance enslave him through addictions and debauchery of all kinds was painful to watch. He would tell you himself that he was looking for love in all the wrong places, and his misguided search led him to two suicide attempts. I can't think of a better illustration of the dangers of serving our own human desires and will. And so Paul pleads, don't use your freedom for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in this single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Another camp believed that what was most important was to maintain Jewish laws and rituals and all of their do's and don'ts, including dietary restrictions and most importantly, male circumcision. They felt that freedom in Christ was okay, but they wanted to stick with the familiar and continue to do the things the way they had always been done before. They thought that in addition to believing in Jesus, they needed to continue in their old ways and trust that their actions were what really counted and that their actions is what would make them right with God. They also felt that others needed to be just like them if they also wanted to be right with God. And so they wrestled with the bondage of idolatry to their own pride, envy, anger, jealousy, strife, arguments, and dissensions. Both camps were afflicted with what Paul called the desires of the flesh. But Paul was vehement that the only thing that counts is faith working through love regardless of whether you're a Jew, Gentile, male or female, slave or free. For Paul, true freedom is love that's governed, directed, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. The core of his response to the Galatians is, follow the guidance of the Spirit and you'll no longer do what the flesh desires. If you're led by the Spirit, you're no longer subject to the law. If we live by the Spirit, the power of the Spirit will evidence itself through love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in abundance in the way we live our lives. The end result of Christ's work of grace, his life, death, and resurrection is freedom for all creation. The gift of freedom is offered to every one of us and it means that we no longer have to depend on our own resources and wonder whether we're good enough or have worked hard enough to please God. Through Christ, we can be assured that by living within the bounds of his love and following the lead of the Holy Spirit, we are more than enough. We are treasured. Author Scott Hosey shares that, C.S. Lewis regularly looked for ways to keep Christians from confusing the fruit of their salvation with the root of grace that alone makes the Christian life possible. 
One of his better known examples involves a six-year-old little boy who comes to his father and says, Daddy, can I have $5 to buy you a gift? The father obliges the child and pulls out a $5 bill out of his pocket. Later, the child comes back to the father to give him the gift that he bought. The father is, of course, thrilled with the gift and thanks and praises and kisses his child for his thoughtfulness and generosity. But Lewis notes, only a fool would conclude that the father came out $5 ahead on that deal. We don't bring to God anything that God didn't already give to us. But God is thrilled as a parent can be when we offer up the gifts of our spiritual fruit. And as loving children, it thrills us to offer these and to receive our Heavenly Father's beaming love over and over again. As Christians, we not only experience freedom from our own personal forms of bondage and oppression, but we've been set free for a life lived in Christ that proclaims and demonstrates that freedom through our loving presence in our families, in our church, and in our community. And so this week, as we celebrate the independence of our nation, the liberties we enjoy because we call the U.S. our home and listen to patriotic speeches and political rhetoric, don't forget that no human can provide us with true freedom. True freedom can only be found in the love of Jesus Christ through the power and guidance of his Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Gracious God, close to us as breathing and distant as the farthest star, we give you thanks for your many gifts to us. But above all today, we give you thanks for the gift of grace, the gift through which the Apostle Paul reached out to the people of Galatia and a gift with which you reach out to us through Jesus Christ. By that grace, O oh God, transform us, renew us, and call us again to be a people of your purpose, children of your righteousness. We pray this then in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As you leave worship, remember, you go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. He has a purpose for putting you there. Christ, who indwells you, has something he wants to do through you, wherever you are. Believe this and go in his grace and power and love. Amen.